of outreach Judaism. As you would expect, the phones have gone crazy on both sides of this issue. Uh, I believe, uh, Rabbi, it's your turn. If you have something to respond to, Jan, you want to lead us into a new thought, go right ahead. Well, I, I don't, I'm not even sure what his point was, and I don't mean that in the derisive way. I, I, I say that with all due respect. I, I am clueless on what the point is. In Psalm 2, it says that uh, you are my son, on this day I begot you. Let's think about that, Psalm 2, 7, which Jan quoted. Now, if the Messiah, if that's talking about the Messiah at all, which is not there in the text at all, and that's why the work of a rabbi is so important, is to elucidate the text. Finish your point, it says, it. on this day I have begotten you. Now, if this is talking about the Messiah, how could on this day God beget you? But what, what was the day before? Well, See, okay, God is eternal. Please, he has no beginning. He has I no think, end. I, I'm a little, and the fact that it was so important for the church to crystallize, to make this text this appear as though it's speaking about written. Jesus. Hold on, guys. We're, we're, all, the last we're both talking about this. Uh, the text says, the text says, couldn't take it out. Jan and Tovia, let me stop you there because you're both talking. I'm not sure if it's because uh, uh, rabbis in Israel, but you're both talking at the same time. It appears you can't hear each other, so we'll have to be very, very careful with that because once both of you start talking, then you add me into it, no one can hear anything. So let's let Rabbi finish his whole point because we still have another half an hour of air time, and then we'll go back to Jan. You know, by the way, this phone call is really a paradigm of what the situation is. The situation is that Jewish people, rabbis like myself, are going to speak about the Bible, and Christians, not normal Christians, that's important for you. Listen, the guys who are right now at the Arch in St. Louis, they're not into this stuff for Jews for Jesus. They go to their Presbyterian church, they're not trying to convert Jews. But I'm saying these very fundam these fundamentalist Christians, they read texts, they read verses in the Bible that just aren't there. They've been altered. They've been mangled, unfortunately, by a fundamentalist church. And then they expect Jewish people not to speak. So, like, I'm sitting here and talking to you and teaching the Bible, and Jan wants to jump in. He wants to say, hey, Rabbi, stop. I, I, I want to explain to you the Christians, what, what, what the Christians believe. But the Bible says, on this day I begot you. The Bible says that God is not a man. The Bible says that the Messiah is to fear God. Now, God doesn't fear anything. So the, the text is so clear and what I encourage, and I'll just say this, and then I'm going to be quiet, and you can turn it over to uh, to Jan or the the listeners. I, I'm going to give a plug because our our website address is outreachjudaism.org, and anyone who wants to study these texts, that's where you begin. Is what does the Bible say? What is God's opinion? Jan, back to you. Okay. First of all, give me two minutes because I need two minutes to explain this. All right. You got it. First of all, if you're listening to Sting. And Sting sings a song, and the song is, Every step you take, every breath you make, I'll be watching you. The original song that Sting sung is about a stalker. If I'm analyzing Sting's song, it's about a stalker. Years later, Puff Daddy takes part of that song and puts it in a tribute to, I think, you know, Biggie Small. And then that little, that little you know, little ditty becomes about a benevolent ghost. The fact is, he took something that existed, put it into something else, and transformed its meaning into something else. I said this earlier, and Tovia heard me, that first time that psalm was written, it was about a king. Traditionally, in the Near East, when a king becomes, you know, becomes a king, you know, when he gets enthroned, everybody says, yay, you're like God's son, We'll protect you. God will take care of you. It's, it's the traditional stuff that happened in Egypt, happened in Mesopotamia, and certainly David was probably influenced. But the fact that that psalm now is put in the beginning of the book of Psalms, long after David is dead, in fact, long after there's a king during the post-exilic time, that we have to ask ourselves, what were the people who were writing the book of Psalms thinking when they put that there? Is it just about a king? No, no, no. The more you read the Bible, the more you read what the Bible has to say, the more you read about the different places that this king comes and he has universal control and universal peace. This is a remarkable individual. This is a messianic hope that existed during the time of the Second Temple period or right before it. What do you think these Christians, these first Jews who believed in Jesus, were, were, were worshiping Zeus 
or, or Thor, they were Jews. Where did they get the idea of a Mashiach? Where did they get the idea of a unique son of God? Where did they get this idea that just came out of nowhere? It was part of the Jewish milieu of the time. Now, I admit, and I told you from the very beginning, that after 90 AD, after the Pharisees took control of what Orthodox Judaism was going to be, there was no other interpretation other than the Orthodox one, which, which, which uh, my friend, you know, Tovia has certainly acknowledged. He says he's an Orthodox Jew. Within that system, there is no Son of God. There is no unique Mashiach. And I'll admit that, but that doesn't mean that before that time, within Judaism, within the many Judaisms that existed during the time of Jesus, there wasn't an idea of a unique Messiah that wasn't just a teacher of righteousness, but that he was going to bring world peace, that he was going to convert the hearts of, of the sons to the fathers, that he was going to transform something, and more importantly, and this was cryptic, that he might be a sin-bearer. Granted, it's not all over the place, but there are places where it seems to indicate that before he could become a king and rule the world, he had to deal with the problem of sin. He had to deal with the problem of men being separated from God. Rabbi, is that true, what Jan just said, that according to your beliefs, that there would not be a, a Messiah, an individual human being Messiah at all? No, not at well, all. Well, not that, but the Bible I mean, tells like us a very dynamic, supernatural person. I, I, it's hard for me to hear if Jan's talking, but... Jenna, I need you to listen up on this, because this is so important for you especially. The Bible tells us what the Messiah is supposed to accomplish. It's not Rabbi Singer. And if, if you'll notice, Dave, throughout our conversation, I never quoted any text from the first century. Every verse I quoted is straight from the Bible, right? That's what Orthodox Judaism is. It's based on the Bible. So let me continue quoting Scripture. I don't want to quote the Nicene Creed from the 4th century. I want, to, I want to quote God. In Ezekiel chapter 37 and Isaiah chapter 2, the Bible tells us the Messiah is going to bring about world peace. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, the Bible tells us very specifically the Messianic age is going to bring about the resurrection of the dead. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 11 that in the days of the Messiah, the whole world will know about God. It will cover the world as the water covers the sea. Scripture tells us, and, and check this out, Dave. Bible tells us in Zechariah chapter 8:23 that in the messianic age, you know what's going to happen? Ten Gentiles of different languages, they're going to grab the shirt of a Jew, and this is what the Bible says, and they're going to say to him, a Jew, it doesn't say a Baptist, it doesn't say someone from Jews for Jesus, it says going to grab the shirt of a Jew and say, take us with you, because now we know that God is with you. That's what the Bible says. So there won't be war. This is going to be a worldwide knowledge of God. And, you know, if you check the news, you'll see Iran is preparing to attack my country, the, the, the nation of Israel. You can see that men and women, American servicemen, are dying in the Persian Gulf, in Iraq and Afghanistan, as we're speaking right now. And terrorists are running over Jewish cars with bulldozers here in Jerusalem. My Bible says that when the Messiah comes, all that's going to come to an end. Not only that, I live directly in front of the Temple Mount. And I can look out my window and see a Dome of the Rock, and I see El Aqsa, two big Islamic institutions that are sitting there right there. And my Bible says that when the Messiah comes, read Ezekiel 37 through 48, that there will be a temple that will stand there, that will be there forever. Now, not only didn't Jesus accomplish any of these things, but the exact opposite occurred after the advent of Christianity. Not only wasn't there peace, but the temple was destroyed and thousands and thousands of Jews were killed. There was no resurrection of the dead. And the knowledge of God did not flourish after the advent of Christianity. But the Jews were exiled throughout the Roman Empire and the knowledge of God was diminished. So here's the key. Judaism is about the Bible, what Scripture says. It's not about a Nicene Creed. It's not about what the Baptist Church says. It's not about what Assemblies of God. It's what is God's opinion? And when, that's what I'm quoting. When we come what back, we'll let, uh, we'll, let Jan, well, we'll let Jan respond to that, and I have a specific question for the rabbi. Uh, you're tuned into the Dave Glover Show. Very, very interesting conversation going on. Jan Moskowitz from Jews for Jesus. Rabbi Tolvia Singer joining us from Israel. Is Jesus the Son of God? If not, then what uh, are the Jews looking for in the Messiah? We'll be right back. 
Welcome back. Jan Moskowitz from Jews for Jesus. Rabbi Tovia Singer joining us from Israel, talking about the Messiah, the, the, whether that uh, in your belief system be Jesus of Nazareth uh, or, or it uh, be someone who's yet to, to come onto the scene. Uh, Rabbi, question for you. As you're describing the things that will come to pass uh, in the, the appearance of the Messiah, those sound, and I, I understand it's God. God does the impossible. But to someone sitting here in St. Louis reading the, the newspapers and seeing what's going on, it seems so impossible. Um, and I know you're a rabbi, not a fortune teller, but how can we get from uh, Ahmadinejad ready to, to bomb Israel and, and the price of oil and all this craziness to a time of peace? It's hard to see getting from A to B. I want to share with you a basic Jewish concept, Dave. If you bow before the God of Israel, you fear no one. That's, that's the foundation of Judaism. Look at me. I'm a Jew. I live in the land of Israel. How many Jews do we have here in Israel? What, about uh, six, six million, right? We're surrounded. I mean, we're surrounded by 200 million Arabs, 22 Arab countries surrounding us, and there's 57 Islamic countries. All they dream about is destroying the people of Israel and the land of Israel. But we have a Bible. It's Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1. God says, look, I know you've got great armies around you, and it seems impossible for a little Jewish state the size of New Jersey, 26,000 square kilometers. You've got lakes bigger than the state of Israel. God said, don't be afraid of them if they've got many horses, if they've got huge chariots. You know why? You know why we're not afraid of Jews for Jesus or Hamas or Islamic Jihad? Because the Bible tells us that the God of Israel is with you. And in fact, the Almighty tells us in, in the book of Genesis, chapter 12, that those Gentiles that bless Israel, I will bless you. So I ask you an honest question. When the Jewish people, we went to war against the Arab world in June of 1967, surrounded by 15 Arab countries, and in six days we destroyed the enemy completely. Could anybody at West Point really figure that one out? I mean, do you understand how it's possible mm -hmm. for a country that basically is about 50 miles wide, what, about 200 miles? Miles long. How is it possible standing up to Syria, Saudi? I mean, would you want to live? I, I know you're concerned about illegal immigration from Mexico, but could you imagine if you were in St. Louis and you know what surrounded you? It's that you were surrounded by Syria, by Lebanon, by Egypt, by Iran. That's who we're surrounded. We, we stand, the Jewish state, in fact, stands between the Islamic world and, in the, and the United States of America. You're surrounded by two friendly oceans. So you're right. The Jewish people, Dave, we're a people of a miracle, but we are also people of faith, and we believe without any question that the God of Israel is with us, and we have a Bible, Ezekiel 38 tells us that Iran is going to rise up, Persia is going to rise up against the children of Israel, and Zechariah 12 says God is going to be with you, he's going to protect Jerusalem. Now, I can't, Dave, guarantee you that St. Louis is safe. But, but I assure you one thing, thing. Dave, Jerusalem, is, Jerusalem yeah, Jen, is in the palm of God's hand. Your question. Go ahead, the question is this. We're, I praise God for his faithfulness to the Jewish people and the preservation of the Jewish people. But the question is, when the Messiah comes, he's not going to be supernatural. He's not going to be a remarkable individual other than just the Messiah. How is he going to bring world peace? Is he just going to go abracadabra, wave a wand, and everybody who hates everybody else is going to be nice? I mean, you talk about all the beautiful things Mashiach is going to do, but you haven't told us how he's going to do it, if he's just a teacher of righteousness or a great rabbi. How is he going to change people? people's hearts and I want to show you something when you said to me before after the coming of, of, of the Mashiach Yeshua Jesus you know the, the, the earth was not filled with the glory of God let me ask you a question long before Yeshua came most of the world were bowing down to rocks they were pagans with the advent of Yeshua and Maimonides even talks about this one of the great uh, medieval rabbis he recognizes the fact that through the coming of Yeshua those people who were bowing down to rocks now worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They now believe in the one who created the universe and have faith in him. The key point here is this. We believe the Mashiach came to, to first deal with the problem of sin, because until you deal with a man's heart, his hand won't matter. You have to change his heart before you change his hand. And that's what Yeshua came to do. He keeps quoting Isaiah. Great book. I love it. But Isaiah 52, 13 talks about a servant 
Uh, we can argue who that servant is, but that servant certainly suffers, and that servant suffers to make atonement, a kippura, for his people. Now, uh, you know what? Most people read Isaiah 52, verse 13 and following through 53, and they just go, gee, it sounds like Jesus. Speaking of which, look, this is an argument or a conversation that's going to go on long, long after, you know, 6 o'clock. Jewsforjesus.org. Go read both sites. Definitely read Tuvia's site. It's got some very interesting things. And then go read our site and see what we say. It's going to take more than a 10-minute soundbite back and forth to talk about what's real here. This is a real issue. And I love you, Tuvia. I appreciate your biblical love of the Bible. But again, you know, it's a Bible that you determined what it means at 90 A.D. at Yavna. You know, I quote Old Testament pa passages, and I talk about a world before the Orthodox Pharisees took over. And it's just as Jewish as the Pharisees' world. And the fact of the matter was that there was an idea of a very unique Mashiach who was going to come, a very unique Mashiach who was going to suffer for the sins of humanity and then establish world peace. Tovia, we have about two minutes left. They're yours. Go ahead. Tell us what you need to tell us and tell us about uh, Outreach Judaism. You know, first of all, the first of all, everything is free on our site. You can download my lectures that go throughout the Bible because I don't quote from ninety, and I don't quote from the year two hundred, and I don't quote from the year three hundred and twenty-five CE, which was the Council of Nicaea, where the doctrine of the Trinity was declared as the orthodoxy of Christianity, which Jews for Jesus completely embraces. Amen. We look at the Bible, and let me say, I, I don't mean this. I hope no Christian would be offended by this, but Jan talked about how wonderful Christianity has been for the Jewish people. So I'd like to, and I'm going to say something that's really sarcastic, but I'll say it anyway. You know, uh, we'd like to thank the Church for the uh, Crusades and the Inquisition and so on and the Doctrine of the Trinity. So our thanks go out there. It's a question of what the Bible says. What does Scripture say? And what we encourage, what Orthodox rabbis encourage the Jewish people and, and Gentiles, go to the Bible, go back to the original text. What does Scripture really say? What is God's opinion? And uh, I want to also thank all the folks out there in the United States who support the land of Israel, who put their hope in the Jewish state, even though logically we don't have a chance. But the state uh, has a blessing from above. And, uh, Dave, I want to thank you for... Uh, giving me a chance to, to join you here on air. Thank you, Tovia. Thank you, Jan, and very my much. my privilege, Dave Tovia. Call a kavod, stay safe. Till the next time. When you come to Israel, Jan, come visit me. We of have course. to buy a little study. Course. We'll be back. <laughs> so, how did you like the debate bet between uh, the guy from Jews for Jesus and the professor from uh, <laughs> from Israel? How'd you like that one? I thought it was excellent. I thought that... Um, it was a trouncy well, one thing I thought was really good about it, and I spoke to Rabbi Singer afterwards, uh, that that you kind of stayed out of it, that you kind of just let them both, you know, give. He he really loved that because it's very rare. He told me when he gets that opportunity yeah. to just have a have a real discussion without it being you know one sided. Or I have very few rules, but one I always have followed uh, in broadcasting: Here we go. never get between two two Jews when Jesus is on the line. <laughs> Just let them go. Just let them go. Let them go. <laughs> it always causes some excitement, usually. But you know what, though? Honestly, this this could sound like something sort of insulting, but we're buddies, so it won't. Uh, both of them, both gentlemen, had Tom and I were, were cringing. We were absolutely cringing. And I've noticed this with Jewish friends, like when I was at law school, watching you, the whole thing, have this ability. Maybe you grow up with it. Maybe it's temple. Maybe it's the way you, you debate and you argue. But have this ability to just knife to the into the heart you know and in then just kind in a kind way yeah. <laughs> with all due respect <laughs> you are going to burn in hell for a thousand lifetimes right. my friend right. i mean they were clocking each other right. you know well, i remember you know one time we were having a discussion here and there was somebody called in and said you know how maybe we could just try to make everything kind of feel the same and I remember that you said this, Tim, and I feel the same way, is that I'd much rather have real good, honest debate about something and try to get to the bottom of it. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with debating, you know, and, and that's so I, I think that it was great. You know, they both really, if you feel strongly about something, 
you, you feel, you know, you, you have to argue about the, it. The one, the tactic that Rabbi Singer took that he said over and over again that the guy never called him out on. Never. And I wasn't about to because I didn't want him turning on me. No. Was when he'd say, listen, you, you can have your whole, you know, Church of Nicaea. You can have your fourth century mole crap. <laughs> but if you want to know what God thinks, let's go back to the Torah show. I right. mean, it's just like right. smack. Well, see, one of the reasons why he was doing that is because the other person, Jan, who I don't know, um, kept saying something about, well, the Pharisees changed things. And so Rabbi Singer's original approach was he quoted a verse in the Torah. So he kept coming back to, you can't, you know, talk about the Pharisees. I'm quoting you something which actually comes from the Torah. And so, but anyway, it was a, I thought it was an exciting discussion. And, and the reason that I, I got you, uh, Rabbi Singer, there, because he's just the best at that. He's yeah. just, that's what he does, and he, you know, he knows how to do it well. Yeah, there's something in the law... I think it's called the best evidence rule, and it's basically that. It, it's, it's nothing genius, but it's if there's if you and Tom make a contract, and here it is, uh, and it exists. I don't care what you say. I don't care what Tom says. Let's right. let's see what the document the says. Contract, right? And that's sort of what you're getting at is that you know what? Rather than what anyone said or right. whatever treatise they wrote, right. let's just read it. Right. Let's just read well, it. I mean, see what it says. Right. I mean, he's saying that this idea that I was saying about how we look at the Messiah was changed at some time. But Rabbi Singer saying, if you go back to, everybody sources themselves back to the original Bible. Yeah. And so if, if you know, you have a verse there, you have to deal with that verse. If you can show a different way of understanding that verse, fine. But first you have to at least explain the verse.